The lab this week is about enzyme activity. And that is very relevant to the energy unit that we're on right now because enzymes are required to carry out chemical reactions. They lower the amount of energy required to carry out a chemical reaction. And because they are proteins, they are very affected by temperature, pH, enzyme concentration, different factors. So the lab this week looks at the effects of two different factors on enzyme activity. One is enzyme concentration and one is temperature. The video that I made previously for explaining the lab procedure no longer exists. So I just removed that link this morning and I'm actually going to revise the questions and I'm revising the plan. The, the plan was that we were going to do activities one and two and you were going to have two weeks to do that. You still have two weeks to do the lab. The difference is that it, we're just doing activity one now. So I am revising the question slightly. Don't be fooled by the fact that it's just one activity. The questions are very long and it requires a graph to be done in Excel and inserted into the lab. So you still need two weeks to get it done. I would say, you know, one week to do the activity and then another week to write up the lab questions. So don't wait till the last minute, even though it's just one activity now. And I'm gonna walk you through all of that today. I wanna to start by sharing my screen and opening the lab document. So sorry, it's gonna take just a second here. We're in week number 10. Okay. Here's the lab activity that we're doing this week and we're just doing activity number one. As always, there's a lot of introductory material. I do wanna talk about the materials you need for this week. So remember at the beginning of the semester that there was that list of additional materials that you need to carry out the labs. And one of them was a three hole punch or just a regular, just normal hole punch. And that gets used this week. And it's not really shown here. It's gonna be on your list of additional materials. The stuff that's in the actual lab bag for enzyme catalysis is just some yeast, some medicine cups, this little Petri dish, two of these plastic dropper pipettes and three of these filter papers. Then you need some stuff from the general equipment bag. In fact, quite a lot of stuff. You need these little plastic forceps or tweezers, the 25 milliliter graduated cylinder. This thing, I think we've used already the test tube rack. You're gonna reuse that thing now, unless yours is completely wrecked. <laughs> If yours is completely wrecked from the previous labs because you know it's oh so sturdy made out of paper, then you can just take some beakers and you can just sit your test tubes inside a beaker. And if you have several of them in there, they'll all stand up just fine in there without the test tube rack. You're gonna be measuring a couple of things. If you don't have a hole punch, you're going to actually be making little squares of the filter paper and they need to be the exact same size as each other and I'll go through that. But otherwise, the only thing you're really measuring the height of is once you get um, your hydrogen peroxide solution into this medicine cup, you're just going to measure the height of that solution and I'll, I'll walk you through that. You need five test tubes from the general equipment bag. This They call this a grease pencil. I call it a wax pencil a thermometer and your 250 milliliter beaker. So quite a bit of equipment. In addition to that, uh, we provided you with a small bottle of hydrogen peroxide. And it was a separate item that was put into your lab kit box. It's in a little brown bottle and it should be labeled hydrogen peroxide on there. It comes to you as 3%. You're going to be doing a, a dilution to get that to 1.5%. You probably should use bottled water 
this week. It, it does work a little bit better than tap water, but if you don't have bottled water, it's not the end of the world. Don't worry about it. Just, you could use tap water. Um, you do need hot and cold tap water. And um, the main reason for that is your yeast are actually living organisms and they're in that little packet. And if you've ever baked with yeast before, you know you have to heat them up to wake them up. They're kind of sleeping in that bag. And when you add them to warm water, they're going to become active. And they're actually living organisms and they are carrying out cell respiration, releasing CO2, using oxygen. Yeast are actually fungi. You need a spoon, a timer of some sort. Um, you're not gonna need the ice because we're not doing the effects of temperature. So you don't need the ice for this experiment. You do need something probably to cover your countertop, even if it's just a bunch of paper towels, um, because the hydrogen peroxide can bleach things out. It just depends on what kind of countertop you're using. I mean, I have a granite countertop that I don't think hydrogen peroxide would wreck, but if you think it could wreck your countertop, be careful too, it'll bleach out your clothes if you spill it on yourself. And then you're going to need to eventually graph and excel. We'll be talked about talking about that. So again, it says here that you need to purchase hydrogen peroxide, but you do not. I'll, I'll tell you the reason for that is when we first started using these lab kits, it was at the beginning of the pandemic back in 2020, and you couldn't buy hydrogen peroxide <laughs> at the stores. So we had these lab kits that required it and our students just couldn't get it anywhere. So we just thought, you know what? We'll just provide it to you. So we just kept doing it. So again, it's in that little brown bottle that's separate in your lab kit box. So that's a lot of materials, but I am going to walk you through this whole procedure on paper because to me, when, when I read this a step at a time, it's, it's a lot. So I am going to walk you through it and I'm also going to watch Wendy Gideon's video with you where she shows you what to do and I'm going to be pausing it and kind of narrating as we go along also. She does a really good job of showing it, but she goes pretty fast. So I am going to pause it and, and talk you through it. This one, the effects of temperature, I have decided to delete. I'll tell you why. It, it just doesn't turn out very well. It's too hard for people to control the temperature and get the temperature just right for these different test tubes. The test tubes are pretty small. So they cool down very quickly and it's just, it doesn't work well enough to make you go through all of that. I am going to ask you some hypothetical questions though about effects of temperature. I'm going to fill in some data and then ask you questions about that data. So rather than having you do this activity too, I am going to use data from when I did the experiment and then ask you questions about it because it is important to understand how temperature affects enzyme activity. You just won't be doing that procedure, if that makes sense. I'm going to stop this sharing and I'm going to go to my iPad. Alrighty. In the lab this week, um, we are looking at reaction rate. And in a typical biology or chemistry class, there are a lot of experiments in which students are asked to measure reaction rate. So this is a really important concept to understand. And I can guarantee that on Lab exam number two, there will be some questions about how we measure reaction rate. Remember that a reaction proceeds from reactants on the left side of the arrow to products on the right side of the arrow. If that reaction is not taking place at all, you'll never get products. In other words, the reactants will just stay there. The reactants will not change into something else. So in order to measure whether that reaction is even taking place at all, you could either look for the disappearance of the reactants, 
or you could look at the appearance of the products. If either one of those things are taking place, then you know the reaction is proceeding from reactants to products. This term rate really is how fast is the reaction proceeding? In other words, how fast are the reactants disappearing and how fast are the products appearing? That's the reaction rate. So you could really measure the rate of either one of those. This week, the way we're measuring reaction rate is distance in centimeters over time in seconds. We're measuring the time it takes for a little paper disc to travel from the bottom of a cup to the top of the liquid. And you'll see exactly what I mean by that in a minute. So the distance traveled is going to be this distance in centimeters. And then you're going to time it to see how long it takes for that little disc to float. So you're gonna be putting it on the very bottom of the cup with your forceps, and then you start your timer and however long it takes for that little disc to float to the top of the surface of the liquid, that's going to be your time. Distance divided by time is going to be your reaction rate. The reaction we're looking at this week is this. This is a very important reaction that takes place in the cells of living organisms. This is hydrogen peroxide. H2O2 is hydrogen peroxide. Hydrogen peroxide is toxic to your cells, but it happens to be the byproduct of a lot of cellular metabolism. A lot of reactions in the cell produce hydrogen peroxide and it is toxic to your cells. So your cells need to do something to break that down into something that's not toxic. Water and oxygen are obviously not toxic to our cells. So hydrogen peroxide becomes water and oxygen. So in this reaction, hydrogen peroxide is the reactant. And then there are two products, water and oxygen. Any questions about that part? What we're studying this week is the enzyme that causes this reaction to take place. This cannot spontaneously happen. Hydrogen peroxide cannot just turn into water and oxygen. It requires the help of an enzyme. And that enzyme is called catalase. It ends in ASE, so we know it's an enzyme. Catalase is produced in an organelle in living cells called the peroxisomes. So peroxisomes in living cells produce catalase. And again, catalase is an enzyme. 
It's the enzyme that converts hydrogen peroxide to oxygen in water. If something happens to cause that enzyme to not function correctly, such as a change in pH, a change in temperature, then that hydrogen peroxide does not get converted to water and oxygen. It just remains as hydrogen peroxide. If we did something to denature that enzyme and it wasn't working, then that reaction would not take place. And we would know that because we wouldn't be getting those products formed. It just so happens that water and hydrogen peroxide are both clear liquids. So from a visual standpoint, it's almost impossible to tell if hydrogen peroxide is breaking down and water is forming because they really look the same. But the cool thing is oxygen produces bubbles in liquid. So you can tell if hydrogen peroxide is being broken down because it releases bubbles. No bubbles means the catalase isn't working. So no bubbles equals inactive catalase. In other words, that reaction is not happening. Hydrogen peroxide is not being converted to water and oxygen. If you do get bubbles, that means O2 is being released, which means the reaction is happening. which means catalase is active because that reaction can't happen without catalase being active. An active enzyme is required for that reaction to take place. And in this case, the way we're going to be measuring whether that reaction is taking place or not is based on oxygen being released, because that's a pretty easy thing for us to observe. If we were in an actual in-class lab setting, oops, you would have some test tubes. And in them would be liver smoothie. <laughs> what we do is we take cow liver from the grocery store and throw it in the blender and make this delicious looking liver smoothie. It smells horrible. <laughs> and we subject that liver smoothie to a lot of different conditions. We add acid to it, we add base to it, we heat it up, we cool it down. And the reason we use liver is because the liver of animals has a lot of peroxisomes. Remember that the liver is involved in detoxification. It's one of the many important roles of your liver is it detoxifies. And hydrogen peroxide is toxic. So a typical liver has a lot of peroxisomes. So if you put that liver in the blender, you're opening up a lot of those peroxisomes. If it has a lot of peroxisomes, that means a lot of catalase enzyme because that's what the peroxisomes produce. So this liver smoothie is really a big solution of catalase enzyme. And if you subject that enzyme to a lot of different conditions, you can measure how it affects the activity of that catalase. How do we know if that catalase is working or not? Remember, hydrogen peroxide, and to balance the equation, we need two of them. If that catalase is working, then oxygen is getting produced. And what you'll see 
is a bunch of bubbles will form on the surface of this when hydrogen peroxide is added. So what we do is we add hydrogen peroxide to the enzyme. And if that enzyme is able to break down that hydrogen peroxide, then these bubbles form. If no bubbles form, then that hydrogen peroxide is not working. Why am I telling you about this hypothetical experiment that we're not doing this semester? <laughs> it's because we're kind of doing the same thing on a smaller scale. What you're doing is you're taking a medicine cup and instead of being filled with catalase, it's filled with hydrogen peroxide. And what you're going to be doing is you're going to make test tubes with different concentrations of catalase. And that catalase is coming from yeast rather than cow liver. You know, I would love to have driven a piece of cow liver to each of your homes and made you put it in your Nutribullet. <laughs> but, you know, this was a little easier giving you a packet of dry yeast. So yeast, which are living organisms, is going to be our source of catalase. Because believe it or not, yeast carry out the same reaction. Pretty crazy. So you're going to have catalase of different concentrations. You're going to have 100% all the way down to 0% catalase concentration. So this is your enzyme and it came from the yeast. You're going to take your little forceps and you're going to take a little piece of that filter paper and you're gonna dip it in here and soak the filter paper. Then what you're going to do is using those same forceps, you're gonna take that filter paper and you're gonna put it down on the bottom of the hydrogen peroxide. Now that little piece of filter paper has been soaked in yeast which means it was soaked in catalase. So it has the enzyme on it, which should cause the hydrogen peroxide to get broken down on the surface of that. And if it is broken down, it's going to start producing oxygen bubbles and it's going to start rising to the top due to those oxygen bubbles. I don't know who thought of this, but it kind of works. <laughs> it's not perfect. <laughs> it demonstrates something all right, but it's not the best because it's kind of backwards of how we normally do it. Instead of having a big thing of catalase and adding hydrogen peroxide, you have a big thing of hydrogen peroxide and now you're adding the enzyme to that. So it's just a little backwards, but it, it does work. So you can assume that if you don't have any of the enzyme on that filter paper, in other words, it's 0% catalase, this means no enzyme, so that means no reaction. So it shouldn't float. If you have 100% catalase, that's the strongest enzyme concentration. So that's the highest, oops, I can't spell today. That's the highest enzyme concentration. So we would expect that to be the fastest reaction rate. In other words, the distance that that little filter paper, paper travels from the bottom of the cup to the top of the cup, the time it takes for that to happen should be the fastest. <laughs> 
it should produce oxygen the fastest and float to the top the fastest at the 100%. I am going to walk you through the whole procedure, but are there any questions just about that? Okay, this part's going to seem really boring, but honestly, I just feel it's really important because when you read those directions in the lab, it's kind of like, huh? What? I don't even know what they're asking me to do. And I'm telling you that because I have the same reaction when I read it. I just go, huh? I have to really think about what they're wanting us to do. These labs, I don't know who they were written by, but they're not written by anyone who's ever done a lab. <laughs> like in general, all of these Carolina labs are written by somebody who's never done a lab. And that's really unfortunate. Okay, again, what we're looking at is hydrogen peroxide being converted to water and oxygen with the help of an important enzyme called catalase. And the source of that catalase is in yeast for this experiment. I encourage you to read the lab first, even though it's probably going to be a little ambiguous, but it will help you to read the lab so you kind of know what you're doing. The next thing you're going to do if you have a hole punch is you're going to punch out about 20, we call them discs, from one of the pieces of filter paper that you've been given. And you're going to store those in the Petri dish that came with your lab kit. If you don't have a hole punch and you don't think you'll ever use one again for the rest of your life, because it's not 1972 and people don't normally put everything in a binder, if that's the case, I totally get it. And in that case, what you're going to do is take that round piece of filter paper and try to make it into squares, <laughs> okay? And those squares need to be a specific size. They need to be six millimeters by six millimeters. And they should all be the same size. If they're not the same size, then you're not really accurately comparing reaction rate. So you're gonna try to make this into little squares. You're gonna cut, you know, cut strips to where you can get to the part that's not rounded. And then you'll start cutting these little squares and you need 20 of them. And that's totally fine to do that. I mean, obviously if you have a hole punch already, go ahead and use it, but don't go buy one for this. It's just, again, if you'll never use it again, then, um, then don't get one. Number three is going to be prepare your work surface. And the reason I'm telling you this is if you need to cover it to prevent bleaching by the hydrogen peroxide, then by all means do that. If you have a white tile countertop, you might want it to get a little bleached. <laughs> so it's totally up to you, but don't get it on your clothes. Don't spill it on anything in the kitchen like a rug that could get bleached out because it will bleach things out. Peroxide is what, um, people use to bleach their hair. It does bleach out surfaces. Now you need some warm water. And you can either just put some water in the microwave and then pour it into your plastic beaker. Please don't put the plastic beaker in the microwave. Use a, something glass and put it in the microwave and then pour it into the beaker. But you need it to be as close to 35 degrees Celsius as you can get it. You do have a Celsius thermometer in your lab kits. You want to try to keep it somewhere warm also because these yeasts really wake up when they stay warm. If they start cooling down, they're not going to be very active. So you're going to get the, warm, the water warm and you're going to add 250 milliliters of that warm water 
to your beaker. Now you're going to add approximately one teaspoon of dry yeast to the warm water. And you're going to stir it gently, but thoroughly. Need to wake those little guys up. Now you're going to take one of those little plastic medicine cups that you're given. And you're going to label it 100% catalase. The directions say to use that grease pencil, but you can use a Sharpie because I don't think we're going to be using these medicine cups again. We're not doing activity two. So you can just label that with whatever works best for you. Now, step seven is you're going to add 20 milliliters of your yeast solution from the beaker to the medicine cup. I would use graduated cylinder for that to measure that. I believe those medicine cups actually have a 20 milliliter mark on them, but I would still use your graduated cylinder. It's just a lot more accurate. It's a good habit to get into. You have two of those drop um, bulb pipettes that are plastic. I would label one with a W for water and label one with a C for catalase. And don't cross contaminate when you're doing the experiment. Any questions about those steps? Now you're gonna take your second one of those little medicine cups. And you're going to label it hydrogen peroxide. Now what you're going to add to that medicine cup is you're going to add ten milliliters of the three percent hydrogen peroxide that you were given in that brown bottle. And again, I would use your graduated cylinder to do that. Plus you're going to add 10 milliliters of water. Bottled water is best, but if you don't have bottled water of any sort, then just use tap water. Just room temperature tap water. What that's going to give you is you're diluting 
that hydrogen peroxide. You're cutting the concentration in half. So that's going to give you 20 milliliters total solution and it's going to be a 1.5% hydrogen peroxide solution. Why are they having you do that dilution? There's really no reason except that maybe they're trying to get you to practice dilutions again. <laughs> I'm guessing that's the reason is they're like, well, dilutions are important. So let's do another one. So there you go. So now what you're going to have in this medicine cup is you're going to have 20 milliliters of 1.5% hydrogen peroxide solution. You started with 3% hydrogen peroxide and you diluted it by adding 10 mils of the 3% and 10 mils of water. Now this cup is really important because this now becomes your experimental vat, so to speak. This is where you're gonna be putting those little pa filter paper discs. And you're gonna be doing it at least 10 times. You have five different concentrations of catalase you're gonna be testing and you're going to test each one twice. And then you're going to average your data. Now in a real lab setting, if we were going to trust this data, we would be doing it more than two times, but they're just trying to give you the, the feel of, you know, you run multiple trials of an experiment. You don't just trust your data from one time to represent the trend. So now what happens is you're going to have to measure the depth of that solution. So number 10 is measure the depth or the height of the solution in the medicine cup. And they mean that hydrogen peroxide solution. And you're gonna measure it in centimeters. I think for most people, it's between 2.0 to 2.1 centimeters, somewhere in there. But measure yours because that's going to be the distance traveled each time. So when that little piece of filter paper gets put at the bottom and it floats to the top, the distance it travels is going to be the same every time. It's going to be whatever the depth is of that solution. This will be the distance. Remember the way we're going to measure reaction rate is distance divided by time. So time's going to be how long it takes for it to float to the top and the distance is gonna be whatever that depth is. So you wanna measure that depth. And record it. Because you're really gonna use that for every one of your calculations. Now, <laughs> whew, you need five test tubes from your general equipment bag. And you're going to either put them in that cardboard test tube rack or an empty beaker. which will serve as your test tube rack. And you're going to label them and you can either do this with a Sharpie or with that wax pencil that's provided in your general equipment bag. You're going to label them 0%, 25%, 50%, Seventy-five percent and one hundred percent. What these are referring to is catalase concentration. Remember, the catalase is in the yeast, so the source of the catalase is the yeast. Yeast and catalase are synonymous in this lab. <laughs> 
because the, our source of catalase is the yeast. Now you're going to make these solutions, the 0%, 25%, 50%, 75%, 100%. You're going to make those by taking that stock of yeast that you made. So remember, we have two medicine cups at this point. One has hydrogen peroxide in it, and one has catalase in it. In other words, one is, has the yeast. You, you made a big vat of yeast and now you've poured part of it into that medicine cup. Now we're going back to that medicine cup. Now at this point, your yeast should have been sitting there for at least like 10 minutes. Okay, they need to sit for a little while in that warm water to be active. And I'm assuming by the time you get all the rest of this set up, you'll, you will have waited that much time. But if not, then make sure, oops. you waited at least 10 minutes after adding the yeast to the warm water. To start making these test tubes. And I'm assuming that will already happened. Okay, now you're gonna make the test tubes. How are you gonna make those test tubes? There is a chart on the actual lab exercise that tells you how to make each one, but I'll go ahead and draw it out for you here also. So you're going to have 0%, 25%, 50%, 75%, 100. And remember, your test tubes are labeled like that. This is going to tell you how many drops of catalase, in other words, yeast. And this is going to tell you how many drops of water that you're going to add to each one of those test tubes. The assumption is that using that little bulb pipette, 20 drops approximately equals one milliliter. So using those two little droppers, remember you labeled one of them with water and one of them catalase. So one of those pipettes on the bulb, you labeled it a W and one has a C. So don't cross contaminate. That's a beautiful picture of those pipettes. You're going to use those to do your drops. So this 0%, this is your control. And I'll go ahead and tell you that shouldn't float. <laughs> okay, it doesn't have any catalase on it. And it should stay at the bottom of the hydrogen peroxide. Why? Because Oxygen is not being produced. There's no enzyme there to break down that hydrogen peroxide into oxygen. So that just shouldn't, shouldn't float. So in this case, it's zero drops of catalase and it's 20 drops of water. In other words, you're dipping it in water when you do this one. But this is what you're putting in the test tube. So this is how you're making your test tubes right here. This first one that says 0% is going to get no yeast in 20 drops of water. This next one will get five drops of yeast in 15 drops of water. Then 10 and 10. Fifteen and five. 20 and zero. So they always add up to 20. So you should have an equal volume in each of those test tubes. They should each have about one milliliter in them. Total of 20 drops. <laughs> 
obviously this one is pure yeast. That's going to be your strongest concentration. This one is pure water. That's your lowest concentration. These test tubes now become the source of the catalase for running the experiment. This is where you're going to dip those little discs of paper. So now we're going to start running the experiment. We have everything set up. We have the medicine cup with the hydrogen peroxide. And now we've made these test tubes that have the different concentrations of catalase in them. Each one is going to happen twice. You're going to run two trials of each one. And for each one, you're going to be starting the timer as soon as that little disc of paper goes to the bottom of the cup, and you're going to measure the time that it takes for it to float. If it gets to be more than three seconds, you just stop timing. So for, another, for example, the 0% catalase should probably take more than three seconds. And it shouldn't float. So at that point, you'll just record it as more than three seconds. And the, the distance it traveled is going to be zero. So no matter what you record for the time, the rate's going to be zero anyway. OK, now here's your procedure for doing the actual, actual experiment. And I'm going to show you um, how Wendy actually physically does this when I show you the video. By the way, going back to this for a minute, after you add the water and the yeast to each of these, swirl each test tube. to mix. The other way that you can mix a test tube, I don't know if you can see this. I can never figure out where my, if this is your test tube, a good way to mix a test tube is hold it up right like this and you just gently bang it against the palm of your hand. And you'll see this sloshing action happen in your test tube that really does a very good job of mixing it. And in lab, that's typically what we do to mix a test tube is you just gently hit it against the palm of your hand like that. Make sure they're really well mixed. Otherwise, when you dip that little disc in there, you might just be getting the water and you don't want to do that. You want to make sure it's really well met, mixed. Okay, now one at a time. Let's see what number I'm on at this point. So you're going to take one paper disc or square, depending on what you cut from the Petri dish with those blue forceps. And you're going to dip it in the 0% catalase test tube. There's a method for doing this that Wendy's going to show you in the video where you actually tip the test tube sideways and then stick, because the solution's way down in there, it's almost impossible to get it down in there with the forceps, they're not long enough. So you're gonna kind of tip the test tube sideways and really soak that paper disc with the forceps. After you do that, here's what you're gonna do. Here's your medicine cup with your hydrogen peroxide. You're going to take your forceps holding that little disc and you're going to put it all the way down on the bottom of the cup. Place it at the very bottom and start the timer. You're going to time how long it takes for this to float to the top. You're gonna stop timing. Oh, I'm sorry, I said it three seconds earlier. You're gonna stop timing at three minutes. <laughs> that makes more sense. Three seconds is pretty fast. Okay, 
You're going to stop timing at three minutes, <laughs> which is 180 seconds. Re you're going to actually record your time in seconds each time because your rate is going to be centimeters per second. Your centimeters are going to be the same every time, right? Whatever this distance is here, however many centimeters that is, that's your distance each time and your time's going to be in seconds. So you you dip that one in the one in the 0%, you put it at the bottom, you wait 3 minutes, you record 3 minutes if it doesn't float. Now you have to do it again. So you're going to run each percentage twice. You're going to take a separate little disc, dip it in the 0% and do it again. So 14 is repeat. You're going to run two trials for each percentage of catalase which again is your yeast. So you run two for the 0%. Okay, then you're gonna dip in the 25% and you're gonna run two trials for that. Then you're gonna dip in the 50%, run two for that and so on. And then each time you're going to record the time for the disc or the square to float to the top of the hydrogen peroxide. And what you're measuring is O2 production that's causing that to float to the top. The bubbles on that disc are going to cause it to float to the top. Again, stop at three minutes. And if it takes longer than that, just say three minutes plus, which would be 180 seconds is what you'll record because we're recording everything in seconds. You'll see on the data table that I'm gonna show you in a minute that you average your two times for each percentage of catalase. So let's say I had one that was 24 seconds and one that was 28 seconds. That's 52 seconds divided by two. The average is going to be 26 seconds. And you'll see on the data table where you have to do that. So remember to get the average, you add those numbers together and you divide by the number of, of data points that you had. So we had two different values that we added together. So we would divide that number by two. Then you're going to be calculating the reaction rate for each one. And the reaction rate is the distance traveled in centimeters divided by the time in seconds. If you don't record your time in seconds, you're not gonna get the correct result. A lot of people will record that in minutes and it won't turn out right. And remember, your distance should be the same every time. It's whatever the height of that liquid was. Now, your favorite part, you're going to create a scatter plot in Excel. So I have posted the video again for how to graph in Excel. And here's what you should be graphing. Your Y should be reaction rate. And make sure you say that it's centimeters per second is the units for our reaction rate. And this is going to be enzyme concentration, zero, 25, 50, 75, and 100. 
Rate is how fast it happens. Which percentage do we think is going to have the fastest rate? A hundred percent. Exactly. We would predict that 100% should have the fastest rate. So you're going to end up with some data points and then you're going to add a trend line. With equation. So that hypothetically you could predict the reaction rate at any enzyme concentration. The title of your graph should be something to the effect of the effects of enzyme concentration on reaction rate. And remember the reaction that we're measuring is hydrogen peroxide and that two is just there to balance the equation. Hydrogen peroxide being broken down into water and oxygen. And it can happen without that enzyme catalase and our source of catalase for this experiment is the yeast. I'm going to show you Wendy's setup, but before I do that, are there any questions about that? Activity two, in theory, you're not changing the concentration. You have the same enzyme concentration each time, but you're exposing that enzyme to different temperatures. The problem is in your kitchen at home, it's too hard to get five different temperatures of water and have them be exact. It's just almost impossible. It just doesn't turn out. So I'm going to give you some data. So you will be answering questions. So you won't do activity number two, but I will have some questions that I'm adding about the effects of temperature on enzyme activity. For this reason, the questions are currently unavailable. I would say by noon today, they'll be reposted with those new questions added. But you won't do activity number two, you'll just do activity number one. Okay, I'm going to stop sharing. Here. Oh, you know what? First thing I'm going to show you really fast is the data table. This is the old version of the questions. Okay, so your depth of hydrogen peroxide solution, remember that's measuring the depth of that solution in the medicine cup. So that number should be the same all the way across. And that depth should be in centimeters. And, you know, truthfully, I wish they had told you to do it in millimeters because it would just be more precise for your calculation. But but that number is gonna be the same all the way across because whatever your depth is at the beginning, unless you spill some, which hopefully you want, it should be the same all the way across. Now, if something happens and you do spill some, be sure to remeasure that height of your liquid. This is the time that it takes for that disk to float and it has to be recorded in seconds for each one. 
So then your average time is going to be in seconds. Remember you add the two together and then divide by two to get that average time. Then your rate is going to be the distance traveled divided by the average time. When you do your graph, you're graphing only the average time. So please don't have three different data points for each enzyme concentration. You should just have one data point, which is your average being used to, to calculate that rate. What you're, what you're going to be graphing is really this number and this number. This is what you're gonna be graphing. Remember, it's going to be the rate's gonna be your y-axis and your x-axis is going to be the different enzyme concentrations. The reason I'm telling you that is you're making this data table here, but then when you get into Excel, remember you're going to have to type a new data table and that new data table is just going to be reaction rate versus enzyme concentration. And that's what you're actually graphing. I have a question real quick. Sure. For when we're measuring the depths with the ruler, do you want us to actually stick the ruler in the cup and get like the line or should we just go off to the side and kind of eyeball it? That's a good question. I guess sticking in the cup is a little more accurate, but I don't think the ruler starts right at the end. I don't have my, oh yeah, here's mine. Um, yeah, see the problem is it doesn't really start at the very bottom of the ruler. So if you stuck it in there, you'd be missing like a, two millimeters at the bottom there. It looks like there are about two millimeters of distance at the very bottom of the ruler. So you'll actually have to hold the bottom of the cup up to where that ruler starts and then go from there. If that makes sense. Okay, so then off to the side. Then. Yeah, and I wouldn't just stick it on the table. You'll probably have to hold that cup up a little bit just because the ruler doesn't start at the bottom. That's a really good point, Kevin. I'm so glad you asked that question. Yeah, everyone, that the ruler doesn't start measuring at the very bottom of the ruler. So you have to move your cup up to really accurately measure that. So you've got a lot of questions here, including your independent, your dependent variable, which one is your control? You've got to write a hypothesis. You need to explain the results in detail, I'm, and I'm going to type in here something to the effect of this needs to be a very detailed answer. You're only really doing one experiment, and this is a 20 point lab. So you really wanna make sure you, you're thorough and correct <laughs> in your answers this time. We're at week 10 of the semester, and you all are moving toward taking classes where your lab reports are going to be long and detailed. And so you need to really start building up to that right now. Then you're going to insert your scatter plot, and I'm going to I'm going to give a little more details on that. that. Um, and then it's asking you to use that equation to predict the reaction rate at different catalyzed concentrations, and you should be able to do that by just plugging this number into the equation that you come up with. Now, this is the part that's going to change the effects of temperature. I'm going to give you some data, and I'm going to ask you some questions based on that data. So you won't actually be doing that experiment. So that's going to, to change a little bit. But I just really want to point out, when you get into Excel to do your graph, you're going to have to type in just the reaction rate and just your enzyme concentrations. And that it's really, this should be um, enzyme concentration across here. That's what this is here. Okay, I'm gonna stop sharing this. And let me go to YouTube.
the whole beginning of this video of Wendy's, I tell you on the instructions, you don't have to watch it until four minutes and 20 seconds, I believe is when she gets, yeah, sorry, 416, somewhere around here is where she gets to setting up the activity. Yeah, so I would fast forward to four minutes and 20 seconds and that's where she really sets it up. The other part is just the background about enzymes. Okay, so I'm going to just show you everything she's got out here. So this is quite a setup. She's used a hole punch, but again, you can use scissors to cut out those little discs of paper. She's stored them in a Petri dish. The reason they're here is so that you can very easily just take your forceps and grab one without getting all the others wet. So kind of have them spaced apart in that Petri dish. So when it's time to grab one, you can just grab one without getting all the other ones wet and contaminating them with a different percentage of catalase. So you're gonna grab one. And the first thing you're going to do um, is you're gonna be dipping it in the 0% and putting it in the hydrogen peroxide. Now she hasn't put her solution in here yet, but your, your setup is, is eventually gonna be that you're gonna have hydrogen peroxide in this one and your yeast is gonna be in this one. This is the cup where you're gonna mix your yeast. So again, make sure this is at 35 degrees. Don't put this container in the microwave. You would have to use a different container to heat the water. And then you're gonna add 250 milliliters and you're gonna add one teaspoon of yeast. If you don't have a measuring teaspoon, like for baking, you can just use the kind you eat out of. The teaspoon's the smaller one and just make sure it's pretty level to the top. You're gonna to add that into the 35 degrees Celsius water and you're gonna stir. And then that gets added to this cup. This is where you're gonna make that dilution with 10 milliliters of water and 10 milliliters of the 3% hydrogen peroxide that we gave you in that little brown bottle. You don't have a bottle this size, you have a small one. Okay, let's proceed a little bit here. Medicine cups that I've labeled, as well as the droppers that I've labeled, the hole punch, that she'll use to make the filter disc cutouts. Don't forget to label everything before you begin with your grease pencil. You'll also need hydrogen peroxide, not provided as well as bottled water. Let's start by making our yeast solution. Take one teaspoon of yeast and mix it with warm water. This is 250 milliliters of warm water at about 35 degrees Celsius. Stir it up. Now, this is our 100% catalase solution. You're going to want to pour 20 milliliters of this into your medicine cup labeled 100% catalase. Next, let's make the hydrogen peroxide solution. To do that, you'll need your graduated cylinder, your 25 milliliter. We're going to pour 10 milliliters of hydrogen peroxide in the graduated cylinder. Add that to your medicine cup. Next, you need to add 10 milliliters of bottled water to your graduated cylinder. Pour the 10 milliliters of water into the medicine cup and stir. Now you have the correct solution for the experiment. The next thing you'll want to do is add the correct drops to the test tube based off of the chart you see at the bottom of page seven in your lab manual. Use your dropper labeled water. And for the two, first test tube, we're doing 20 drops of water. In other words, that's a 0% catalase solution. The second test tube, we will add 15 drops of water and five drops of catalase. This is 25% catalase. Continue. Now we're ready to do the experiment. Use your metric ruler, making sure you use the metric side to measure the distance this filter disc will travel. Now she's able to press it down to get to the bottom of the cup because she's got it on a fluffy towel. So if you had it on a fluffy towel, you could just push it down, but otherwise you're gonna need to hold your cup up a little bit. 
in centimeters. Use your tweezers to grab a filter disc. Immerse that filter disc in the catalase test tube solution. Place it at the bottom and record the amount of time it takes for the disc to float to the top. Okay, that's it. Now she's going to do activity two. So she doesn't really walk you through all the steps, but I think it's important to actually see what she meant by that thing floating to the top. That was pretty fast. Um, she showed herself dipping it in the 25%, but I, I think it must be sped, sped up because I don't think it really happens that fast for the 25%. The catalase test tube. But see how she's tipping that to the side? The reason she's doing that is there's not enough in there to get that all the way down if you don't tip it sideways. And remember, you're going to do it twice. So after you run that one once, you're gonna do that same one again. Place it at the bottom and record the amount of time it takes for the disc to float to the top. Any questions about that? Okay, well, I plan to have the new questions up by noon today and I will have some further instructions typed on there to make it really clear that you're not doing activity two, but you will have some questions about it hypothetically if we had done it. The only experiment you're running is activity one. Again, this is worth 20 points and it's due in two weeks. So this week you really just need to focus on the, the lecture exam on energy, cellular respiration and photosynthesis. Really watch those videos twice if you can. This is some tough material. And as far as the lab goes, if you want to do the whole thing next week, it's totally up to you whether you do the whole lab next week or if you, if you do the lab this week and then write it up next week. This is one that's pretty tough to do with your lab partners. So I would kind of recommend doing it on your own and then getting together maybe next week to talk about your results. That's kind of what I would say to do. But as always, if you have questions while you're doing it, don't hesitate to reach out to me. If you have questions about the lecture material, same thing. The lecture exam, I believe, is all multiple choice. Let me just double check on that. The study guide this time is very detailed. Really make sure you've answered everything on that study guide before you attempt to take the test. There are a lot of really good questions on that study guide. Yes, it's 35 multiple choice questions, no short answer or essay, but it's only 45 minutes. So you need to really know the material. If you have questions, feel free to stick around and ask. I'll stop recording and otherwise have a great day and thanks for being here today.